Um, it's just an absolute pleasure to welcome this next panel. Uh, just really quickly, we'll introduce and ask Chris Taggart, uh, Merritt Bayer, Jasmine McNeely, and Mark Etienne uh, to come join us up at the, at the, I don't know, this isn't really a podium, the, the slightly taller chairs. Um, <laughs> This is, the, the, this is the, the only plenary panel of the day, and so I hope that you'll all kind of engage. The idea is that everyone here is representative in some way of one of the core tracks. So, um, and, and Chris wrote a really brilliant piece, which I'd encourage everyone on their computers and, and phones to also look, look up, uh, called Fireflies and Algorithms, essentially about the way that corporate forms and corporate structures are changing and affecting each of these tracks. Um, so that's how we'll kick off. We're batting one of four in terms of sit. Jasmine, do you want to come on up? Sorry, this is, I'm just, this is, they're not super formal introductions. Apparently, we were supposed to mic you up earlier. Sorry. Um, so yeah, and Merritt is also, I guess, getting mic'd up. So yeah, almost, almost ready. Uh, do you want to lead off? Yeah, sure. Should we, we should wait for Merritt to start, right? Yeah, we should wait for Merritt to start. I think we should wait. Yeah, so everybody take this, this opportunity to come join us on the hashtag and the etherpad, which are sentences I totally always expected to say. <laughs> as much as I enjoy the free advertising. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we should probably be here. Hey, Sean, is the etherpad something we can share, or is that just for attendees? Uh, it, please do feel free to share it. The, uh, we're a little bit tempting the content moderation states, but um, we'll take it down if it, if it goes south. <laughs> um, well, I, want, I want to wait for Merit, if that's OK. Sure. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, my name is Chris Taggart. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Corporates. It's a, a social enterprise. Um, our mission is to make company information more widely available um, for the public benefit. And uh, we currently have about 180 million companies from uh, 139 or something jurisdictions. And that jurisdictions is something I think is going to be, that word jurisdiction is going to be pervading this entire day. I think it's really um, interesting and, uh, and critical. Um, I've just asked just to, to maybe uh, just to frame um, the, the, the panel discussion a little bit by talking about um, uh, a bit about uh, the Fireflies piece and, uh, and, and the world we're living in um, from, from our perspective. So I wonder, what is it like to be a god? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this. I had a run. I was trying to figure out what to, how to, to start this. But in a sense, that's what you know, uh, that's what you know, many of us have, have, have been over the past few years. Um, a god, I think, you know, when you have these uh, computer simulation games and so on, it's, you know, to give life to something and, and also to be able to extinguish it just like that. You know, it's like that, that, that power to do something. Um, I talk about that because that's what's actually happening when we, when we create a, an incorporated entity, when we create a company. We're giving something, we're, we're creating a legal person. We're giving something life. Um, we are, uh, and actually when we close it, we're, 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 we're killing it. And we just heard what, how, how easy it is to, you know, oh, wait a minute, uh, this, this thing isn't working so well. You know, Cambridge Analytica, we'll just close it down. We'll just shut it down. We'll kill it. And, uh, you know, this, this legal person, you know, uh, when we create a legal person, which is more or less like a grown-up, because already they have the power to enter into contracts, to have assets, have liabilities, to, to break the law, um, and uh, to sue and be sued. Uh, and, you know, let's say it's a, an English company or a Delaware company or Panamanian company, subject to the laws, you know, it's created subject to the laws of, of that jurisdiction. Um, okay, uh, fair enough. That's, we, we understand about companies, or we think we understand about companies. But this issue about jurisdiction is a, is a really tricky thing because, you know, when, when you have a, a UK company or an English company, uh, technically that's you know controlled or owned by a Panamanian company or Delaware company or Seychelles company or something like that then then what's really going on when when a, a Seychelles company sues a, a British company what's really going on what's actually happening is that the, the the UK is 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 going along with this legal fiction you know companies don't exist you can't they don't have atomic structure you can't put them in handcuffs you can't jail them 
Um, you, you can maybe uh, kill them, but you, you, you can't do those sorts of things. And so when this, is, this legal fiction is, is something that's a, 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 you know, this, uh, is a construct that the, the, everyone agrees in the courts, the laws agree, the, 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 the government agrees, the courts agree, that this thing actually does exist, uh, even though it doesn't really. Um, but what happens when it's another country that's created this thing? Then it's created and worked and operated under the laws of that thing. And actually, just interestingly, the, the uh, once upon a time, countries didn't automatically recognize other companies, the existence of companies in other jurisdictions. It used to be by treaty, bilateral treaty. And then gradually we sort of moved into the, the, the global WTO-ish world that we, we, we live in, and then it just automatically happens. But if someone, if you say, oh, well, we can't have a, uh, companies can't be, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, directors need to be this sort of type thing, or they need to be controlled by, in this mechanism, but actually a company is controlled by another company in another jurisdiction, which is controlled by another company in another jurisdiction, the ability to really say what's going on, to be able to control this, disappears completely. And this is really critical because, um, and this is critical to the data world, the technology world that we live in today, because there are two big trends in the world, I think, today. One is the datification of our world. So everything is becoming about data. Everything, you know, not just, you know, not just uh, uh, what we do and things like that, but our experiences are data. Um, what we're feeling, how they're happy, what our moods are, sentiments, and so on. And the second is, is what I think of as the contractualization of the world, or... Um, transactionization of the world, everything is a transaction. Things when we used to you know, go from A to B using a printed piece of paper, which was a, a, you know, a, private, a, a private experience, now we, we have a contractual experience with Google or CityMapper or, or whatever, and, behind, you know, and we're sending them data, they're sending us data, we're sending them data, we're sending us data. Lo all of this is underpinned by contract, and behind that contract is a thousand other contracts, and behind those thousand contracts is another thousand other contracts and so on. And that's the world that we are. Uh, that's the world that we are living in um, today. And I think that the 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 other critical aspect is that once you start putting things on, you know, on, on computers, once you start programming things, there's no stopping it really. When, in company or co in corporation, this act of creating a life is 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 one that was traditionally a piece of paper and still for some places still is a piece of paper you go in or even if it's not a piece of paper you sit on a computer terminal and you enter some information and then uh, you know a, a few hours later or a day later they they, they they do it but we're now moving in the world of into um, programmatic company formation this is already happening um, uh, it's just not properly it's just not widespread yet and when you, when you move towards this, then suddenly everything changes. If you think about what the stock market was uh, 30 years ago when it was uh, people in pits, uh, funny colored jackets and, and paper and so on, and that moved electronic, suddenly you got algorithmic trading uh, where, where deals were split up in small amounts. Then you got programmatic trading where based on certain signals um, uh, you, you would trade. And then you got high frequency trading and that's fundamentally where we're going with, with company formation, where company networks will be changing every day, because why not? It's easy to write a computer code program to do that, where companies will exist not just for a day. We already have companies that exist for a day for individual transactions, um, but you know, an hour, a minute, a second, because if it's a, a, a company that's set up just for one transaction, uh, and, and often as a conduit, then why does it need to exist for more than a second? And, and actually you say, well, we won't allow that. The UK won't allow that. But actually what if the, the Seychelles does allow it or the Cayman Islands does allow it? And with this, with this network that we have, it's, it's not possible. And then finally, we're probably going to have a, a AI controlled companies as well, just to throw it into the mix. So I think this is the... <laughs> this is the... Uh, um, uh, yeah. So anyhow, um, uh, imagine, you know, we really are playing these computer games and we really are being able to do this and set the things up. It's not difficult. Technologically, it's not difficult. It's just it's not being widely distributed, distributed yet. Anyway, with that, I'm going to shut up and uh, introduce the, um, uh, ask the, the three panelists to, to uh, uh, talk maybe for uh, five minutes or so uh, each. Um, and... Uh, uh,
uh, and then then I think we're going to get into a, a, a QA. We've got I, I'm incredibly impressed by the by the panels. I mean, I, I have to say I'm incredibly impressed by being at this event. I think it's such a an exciting. I've been looking forward to this for for a long time, and I think it's a a, a, a superb event. Like that, I'm going to um, maybe if we start um, with um, uh, Mark Etienne, if that's okay. Sure. Go for it. If you, I, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves because you're doing a much better sure. job than I will. Um, well, hello. My name is uh, Marc Etienne. We met. You can call me Mark if you can't pronounce French names properly. Uh, I'm the head of public policy at a company called Element AI. We're based in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, we just turned three years old in October. We're just a little under 500 employees. We raised a total of about 350 million in the first few years. So it's been a it's been a bit of a of a rocket ship ride uh, in getting set up. Uh, but the company, from its very inception, decided to invest pretty heavily in public policy and government relations, which isn't standard for, for you know, small startups uh, that are just getting started. And the reason why that was is that our co-founders um, included someone called Joshua Bengio, who is kind of one of the um, you know, seminal thinkers with regards to, to deep learning and, and neural networks, uh, along with uh, Yann Lecar and Jeff Hinton. They won the Turing Prize this year. It's like the, the Nobel of uh, computer science. Uh, and the other two, joined uh, Google to lead their machine learning efforts and Facebook to lead their machine learning efforts. So when Joshua decided that he would not join uh, one of the big four, but instead uh, try to start his own company, uh, his interest was in democratizing access to AI and in trying to ensure kind of a responsible company uh, from the very inception. And so we do our involvement in public policy because you know the, the anchor of our co-founders uh, thinks it's the right thing to do. So there's not always in every act that we take uh, a clear link with company profitability. Often it's just because it's a reason to keep the, the co-founder uh, interested and excited in the company. But the other reason that we do it is, is also because of medium to, to long-term business interests. So if you're going to attempt to build a responsible AI company, you are going to be taking on massive uh, companies, many of which are going to be acting extremely irresponsibly in deploying their products. And the reality is that if you deploy irresponsibly, it is much cheaper to do. And so you are going to be able to undercut uh, companies who are trying to act responsibly in almost every circumstance. So if you don't have uh, both market incentives and legal and regulatory infrastructure to not only incentivize, but force uh, responsible behavior and certainly put barriers in place uh, for those companies that act irresponsibly, then you are not going to get the type of responsible actions and uh, companies that you're, you're looking to get. So prime example of this, we were talking about Facebook, stock's been going up, right? So it's notwithstanding the fact that we've seen everything that's going wrong and, and extremely irresponsible actions, it doesn't you know, ultimately affect uh, the profitability of the company. And notwithstanding the fact that we have uh, co-founders who are very vested uh, in trying to achieve this, we also, as I mentioned off the bat, raise a lot of money and those investors expect returns. Uh, and ultimately, we're going to need to be able to, to demonstrate that. And so our medium to long-term goal in our public policy and government relations outreach is to try to create uh, a legal and regulatory ecosystem that uh, creates those barriers and, and supports uh, companies like us. You've seen a lot of national AI strategies uh, come out over the last few years. Canada was a leader in this, uh, but since then you've seen you've seen the French, you've seen uh, you know even Argentina just released a, a national AI strategy uh, not so long ago. But those are largely uncoupled from kind of policy and legal accountability mechanisms, and there's also weak differences in the type of industrial policy strategies to support that national AI strategy between supporting companies who are responsible and are following these ethical declarations and those that aren't. And a prime example of that is the French strategy is called AI for Humanity, but 85% of public French contracts go to Palantir. So in practice, <laughs> you can see it whatever way you want, but they're not really putting anything in place to try to support different types of behavior. So, so what do I do and what does my, my team do? Well, we try to uh, come up with actionable policy and, and legal tools that government can start uh, to implement. And we work at the national and international levels. I think you know part of the uh, the reason for the article that, that we all read that uh, you guys worked on, uh, the Firefly article, the points to is this kind of 
malleability and, the, and data flows, international data flows, and the need for a, a, a certain degree of international regulation. Certainly, we agree with this, and that's why we support, amongst other things, that the global partnership on AI, not to be mixed with the partnership on AI, it's a new alignment of <laughs> the French, the German, the UK, and the Canadian governments that got together to start to collaborate on, on policy and legal uh, regulation uh, of artificial intelligence. But I don't think that that should be done as opposed to domestic legislation and regulation because it's an easy way for my opponents who lobby for Facebook and Google, et cetera, to just punt the ball further down the road. Because if you're going to try to create an international uh, standard and network uh, and system of regulation, it's 10 years minimum down the road. And I don't think we can wait 10 years for these things to, to happen. The other thing is that domestic legislation um, sets standards and ends up creating uh, the basis for ultimately international uh, collaboration on, on policy and legal infrastructure. You see this, see this with the GDPR. I mean, the GDPR had a massive impact outside of Europe. Uh, certainly Canada, uh, partially because of our free trade agreement with, uh, with Europe, uh, needs to be GDPR compliant itself and is currently looking at uh, its privacy regulation and, and other legal tools in order to be compliant. So even the fact that, well, yes, this wasn't national, it was multinational, but the fact that it was regional, it still has a, a global impact. So I don't think that we need to limit ourselves from, from looking at domestic legislation. The other thing that I thought was stimulating about the article, and I used to be a corporate governance lawyer, and before that I, I taught a corporate history class, so I, I found it very stimulating for a bunch of reasons, yeah. uh, is just the, the relative artificiality of this entire infrastructure. And I you know, lead a team of, of public policy experts, but I principally lobby uh, in, in Canada and Europe and, and a few other jurisdictions. Not so much here. It costs too much money to lobby here. Um, so you know, in doing that, often I will try to point to the, to the artificiality of these structures and the fact that you know, we are not necessarily beholden to them. And I think that's a case that sells uh, relatively well, especially when we can demonstrate you know, the impact of, of, these, uh, of these legal structures on citizens. But what politicians and political staff certainly expect is to not only raise red flags, but come up with concrete solutions. So Bianca and I were talking about this last night at dinner briefly. I mean, everybody, and you have to have a certain degree of empathy for ministers and, and political staff. They'll meet with me to talk about data governance. The group after me will be the Poultry Association of Canada. The group after that will be the Canadian Auto Workers. And everybody's coming with problems, right? So you got to show up with potential solutions and tools. And so in, uh, in the corporate accountability um, you know, framework that, that your team works on, to talk about who the ultimate beneficiaries of those companies are. I mean, you can convert that into a very specific tweak to the CBCA, the Canadian Business Corporations Act, to say Section 27 should be changed and now read this. So if you can show up in those types of meetings and propose concrete recommendations and also talk about who can be, who will be affected negatively and positively and try to build that, that stakeholder coalition, uh, then I think you, you have a chance of actually uh, achieving change. The other thing that I try to point to um, is the fact that we don't always need to reinvent the wheel. There's this you know, view that artificial intelligence changes everything, and yes, it'll have a massive impact, um, but despite you know, what many of the engineers, I'm sure, in the room and everywhere think, uh, you know, the rest of the world has existed for a very long time. Uh, the, the law has adapted to many, many different structures and technological changes. Uh, and we have something like the human rights framework that since the Magna Carta has been built up uh, that has international applications, um, you know, the, the UN, um, you know, human rights principles written by McGill Lawyer, I should say, uh, are in place. There's domestic legislation in many countries with regards to uh, human rights, along with actionable recourses and private rights of action, certainly, certainly in Canada. Uh, and so if there are human rights violations as a consequence of the deployment of either AI technology or the use of data, it's not about creating a novel legal structure, it's about understanding how those rights are impacted. And so the work that certainly you're doing is fantastic on that front. And also explaining to ministries and departments where they have responsibility in protecting uh, said rights and applying those. And again, we can accompany them in, in doing that work. And so I don't think that that is necessarily that seismic of a change for, for governments to be responsible for. And that's where we, we try to, to concentrate and making those types of recommendations. So 
just to finish on this, the last two things we've principally been working on uh, are the human rights framework as an analytical tool to inform uh, the obligations of governments and departments and agencies. Uh, and then we've been working on data trusts uh, along with Sean and, and, and many people in the room uh, as one of the types of, of novel tools that we think we can, we can continue to, to push forward. And we're collaborating with Mozilla and a few others as well in trying to, to pilot some of those structures out. That's it. Great. Thanks very much. Jasmine, go for it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do questions and maybe do questions at the end and then we'll, we can give you questions amongst each other as well. So. All right. Um, well, thank you and good morning. Um, I'm supposed to talk about governance as it relates both to your article but also in general. Just data, in general, yeah. Data yeah, governance. Um, so I guess, I guess the, the opening thing for me is always uh, because I study communication, mass communication, one of the first things I want to know is like, what do we mean when we say governance? How are we defining data governance. So when we think of governance, of course, we think <coughs> of government. Um, I think it's, it's larger than that. Of course, we're talking about structures and systems and processes in place or created to do something. In this case, for data, it is created to both protect and prescribe, but also assist I think, uh, in, in a governance structure. And one of the things about the article that you wrote that I really like, because it harkens back to law school, of course, is mm. the idea of the legal fiction. Like, what is a organization? Um, not just what is an organization, but what is law in general? Like, law is a set of principles or ideas that we say, we decide, for most of us anyway, decide we're going to follow within uh, certain boundaries. At the same time, law means, law is normative, right? It's in a perfect world, this is what would happen. But humans don't behave that way. Organizations certainly don't behave that way. So what do we have to do to make sure that within this framework we're talking now, we're talking about data, we're talking about the deification of everything, how do we create law that both reflects how humans actually behave or is flexible enough to in some way uh, respect how humans behave, both protecting them from the impacts of data extraction and use and insecurity, but also allow for the innovation that people want so much. That's the big question I think that we have. Um, I'm more concerned with the impacts of data extraction, data usage, data collection, aggregation. What happens to people, to individuals, when data is used within systems that are historically corrupt, historically uh, misrepresentative, historically exclusive, what do we do in those situations and how do we perform governance or create governance that then reflects what needs to happen, that, that is actually normative, right? That in that perfect world, then everybody is created equal. Everybody is treated equally. Everybody has the opportunity to have the algorithm, so to, so to speak, judge them fairly when that algorithm is trained on historically corrupt, uh, biased training material. Can we figure out how to do that is the question. And so, and, and Ravi mentioned this earlier, and, and we've, I think I've heard this uh, quite a few times already early, and that is the ecosystem. So I think we need to take an ecological approach to data and data governance. So ecological approach looks at not just that we have this data, we have this data, we need to find out something to do with it. Uh, that's management. We need an ecological approach looking at data is not a separate single observation, but that it's in a system and it is social and it is networked and connected, not just to what we want it to say, but to the individual, but also to all the other individuals that that individual is then connected to. But also the social structures and the actual physical and digital infrastructures surrounding it, so context matters. And so then what does context mean for governance? It means that we need the most amount of 
input and participation possible to create an actual governance structure that approaches what we want for how we govern data. So that means, and, and I've said this before, like I don't like the um, metaphor of the table, like seats at the table and voices at the table, um, voices in the room. Uh, what that means is that certain people need to be able to create their own governance structures and communities need to be able to create their own governance structures for data. And communities know each other. People put themselves in community. That we talked earlier about community. Mm -hmm. So people know, them, people know the communities they want to be in and, and they can also find and people find community as well. But let certain communities create their own data governance structures, their data governance systems. What this means then is that people need to be able to govern themselves. People need to be able to participate more. Um, actually, in systems that we have right now, uh, where we say like social media has democratized participation and those kinds of things, actually when you have systems like, and obviously we say Facebook, well, Facebook is an easy target, but there are v like a lot of different systems. Facebook, which is corporate, but there's also governmental organizations and there are uh, civil society organizations who are collecting just masses and masses of data which actually hurts participation. People understand that they're being surveilled. People understand that they're being datafied. And that actually changes how they actually behave. And that's not necessarily a good thing, mm. right? So if we want true participation, if we want true governance, right? We need to be able, people need to be able to feel free to participate. But not just to feel free to participate, but that their participation is actually involved in shaping the system. Um, for a corporate organization, this could actually be, and a, this may sound really kind of crude, this could actually be a marketing, a selling point. How do we get the uh, data with the most integrity? Well, we go to the people. And it actually has been used as a selling point, just like privacy has been used as a selling point, data governance can be used as a selling point. But for those other organizations who have a bit more uh, at stake, or at least their history is such that they're supposed to be for the public and for society, then really getting to the purpose of serving their communities that they're supposed to be serving, they really need the participation. Now, Sean has written about civic trust and, and Keith as well about the civic data trust, about the participatory nature of uh, those possibilities. Well, the idea is to get people to say what they want and what they don't want. I'm encouraged because there are communities, there are people who are working and building governance structures for community and for data. And it goes against that fiction of, of law. And it goes against the fiction of the corporation who is just like, the person. Because it says, well, you might be a person, but you're not a person with respect to being able to lay claim over what is us. And that is the data that you want. So there are uh, communities who are saying like, well, you know what, you, you want to use this data, then you have to play by our rules. You have to use our models. You have to respect what it is that we want. And then it's a license. You don't own this. I think that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. How do we get that at scale is a different question. And that's, a, that's something that we have to I can think real, really uh, uh, hard about. Will data trust or other governance structures be something that each uh, municipality has to wrestle with, which each separate community has to wrestle with, with each kind of data? So are we going to... Um, you know, separate health data from mobility data, from you know, environmental data. These are questions that we have to wrestle with. What, but if we're not wrestling with them now, then we still have the system that we have now, which means that we have very little input as to how people use and collect and secure the data that's produced all the time. Perfect, thanks.
Yeah, that was perfect because uh, I'm a security person. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Merritt Bear. I work for Amazon Web Services, which is the cloud. Um, so this is actually a really good juncture. Um, yeah, I know. I don't mean that in an Amazon ego way. It just like is a fact on the landscape. Um, but I and a lot of what I'm saying today is not uh, Amazon language. This is just merit bear as an individual. But of course, with the lens of my experiences, um, and I'm here to represent in this track the engineering frame of mind, um, which I think works well because um, you know, as Chris was talking about the creation of a life, I was kind of like. Yeah, so white men think that the creation of a life is when they form a company. I'm currently creating a life, so <laughs> let's just benchmark a little bit here. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I think it's Touché. a good juncture to talk about you know, computers too. We're not talking about, so as we think about this world where there's tons of data, and I will give the kind of framework here that when I go into a room, I say to customers, because we're trying to like help them understand all the capabilities they might be able to unleash with data. Um, and these are often you know, unsexy things that you don't think of a lot, like industrial IoT for agriculture. Or you know, I work with, um, well, I'm now in a worldwide role, so everything from public sector, so governments and municipalities and education, up through um, Amazon.com, you know, some of our largest customers. So we're talking about lots of complex regulated entities, everything from startups on up. So oil and gas, healthcare, manufacturing, high tech, uh, et cetera. And I say to customers, if you could have all the data and you could run unlimited analytics on it, what would that change about how you act, how you operate? Um, and that's just me pointing to the fact that in cloud, you are kind of unburdened from the physical infrastructure side. But I also think that what Chris and some other folks, I think, sometimes give too much credit. Those who don't live in engineering day to day sometimes give too much credit to the idea that engineering is somehow going to like take over. There's humans on the other side there. Algorithms don't exist in a vacuum. They're programmed by someone. By the way, disproportionately white guys. You know, this all matters. And so some of the context here around thinking through the engineering considerations should be thinking about, um, you know, why do we take for granted that a corporation is a person? That's a Scalia construct. Corporations are people and money is speech. That's a Citizens United bullshit that we now live with, right? So I mean, some of this takes some zooming back and saying like, no, we're the ones in control here. We can have a conversation about values. Coming back to some of Jasmine's point about um, law, you know, as a, as a normative construction, we are the ones in the driver's seat here saying, I think we should have a conversation about our values, right? What do these laws exist for? Why do we think, you know, there are certainly good conversations. Right now, there's a ripe conversation around Section 230 and content moderation, for example. Well, this was a good thing to come out. By the way, the ACLU still is in, uh, you know, strong support of Section 230. It provides harbor for, um, you know, content uh, pro what, platforms, let's say to not be liable for the content that they provide. We now feel very mixed about that, given uh, Facebook and other entities that host you know, uh, concerning content. Um, and as with a lot of things, it actually, I think, uh, often starts and ends with child pornography as one that we all agree is gross. Um, but having conversations about whether and how corporations should be liable is an age-old conversation and one that we should continue to have. And we don't need to take for granted that they are people or that they have a certain set of rights and liabilities. We are constructing those. And I think we should continue to have that conversation. Um, from a, uh, an engineering point of view, I just wanted to give an anecdote um, that we can launch out on here, which is that um, in the wake of GDPR, I was advising companies on how to implement, like what it would look like now. And by the way, when a new um, regulation comes out, you know, Mark is right in that, um, sorry, I could have attempted the French pronunciation. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Sophie. Um, that uh, one, one regime implementing something will influence others in part because as an engineer, you have to architect for the high watermark. So like when Germany comes out with something that's higher, um, whatever, higher intensity, whatever kind of descriptor we want to use, I think of it as more handsy. Um, 
than other countries, you have to architect for that high watermark. Um, and so with GDPR, American companies, um, especially those that are in regulated data sets like healthcare, um, were coming to us saying, what are other entities doing around this? And the reality is, um, and those of you who are in the room will probably be uncomfortable with this, and I was too, having things like the right to be forgotten requires companies to have granular access to personalized data. So you've got to be able to identify the person based on social security number or whatever their national identity uh, mechanism is. And you've got to be able to produce it within a short time frame. So not only are these companies now forced to keep identifiable data, they have to keep it warm, um, which is both more expensive and often less secure um, because you can store, DN you know, like storing things in colder data stores might allow you to um, decouple the uh, identifiers and just uh, not, not need to be able to recouple those in a short time frame. Um, it's both cheaper and uh, more, I guess, uh, I guess more secure. Uh, I'm, but, but certainly contribu contributes less to that discomfort we feel if they are in colder data stores and decoupled from the identifiers. What GDPR requires is something that allows you to actually grab in with great granularity an individual's health records. And whereas, you know, a, a pharma company might have been satisfied with having uh, you know, John Doe comma 40 comma heart disease, now they have to have who you are. And so now they have to protect that. And they also have to be able to grab it. I've seen, um, you know, DEF CON and other folks doing uh, experiments where they call up and pretend to be the person trying to get their right to be forgotten. It's very hard to authenticate someone who's asking to be forgotten when the whole premise of this is that you're using your national identifier, which by the way, we know to be not very safe. So there's all of these elements, and I actually have seen basically then the requirements of GDPR enforce something like the Chinese government's handsiness on their own citizens where they can grab an individual's records. So think about the engineering consequences of what you're requiring. If you're, I think we circle back to that, what are your values, like what's the good here? Um, and then think about what the kind of, and talk to engineers about what the repercussions will be on the ground for how they have to re-architect or architect for uh, satisfying these compliance requirements, some of which may end up being at odds with the goods we were trying to get. Great, fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, before I pass it to the floor, I wanna ask one, one, one question. I'm gonna take the uh, privilege of, moderator's privilege. Uh, Jasmine, I think this is for all of us, uh, for all of you. Um, uh, you talked about you know, communities and groups and uh, taking different approaches. So in general, do you think, this is a difficult question to answer maybe, but are we wanting you know, this, this diversity, this diversity of approach, the diversity of law that you've traditionally had with, with, with uh, multiple jurisdictions? Obviously, from an from a ecosystem point of view, diverse, that sort of diversity is essential. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it can often, you know, historically, when you're looking at things like tax and, for example, or regulation, it's being used to enable uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, um, which actually can consolidate some of those things that you're trying to do. Do you have a perspective, and this is probably for, for Mark as well, and, and, and maybe uh, for, for Mayors, I mean, you, you'll probably deal day to day with different jurisdictions and different, and different issues. Is this, is this uh, differential approach a good thing, net, or a bad thing? Uh, I would say it was a good thing. Mm. So if I'm looking strictly at the United States, so we have federal governments, we have state governments, and we have like municipal governments. Mm. But uh, for the most part, municipal governments, local governments, are more reflective of the people. Not always, mm. of course, but are reflective of people who participate in those or who are able to participate in those governments. And so they're uh, more apt to reflect the needs of their communities because the communities are there, the communities are participating, are engaged, whether it's because they like something mm -hmm. or because they really do not like something. And so I think the diversity of these approaches to governance mm -hmm. of, of data has to reflect the fact that context matters that uh, we're in DC right now, but Northwest DC is not the same as across the, you know, like there are differences in DC 
There are differences in, we call this the DMV area, but DC and Virginia and Maryland have a separate context completely, right? There are a lot of universities within this, uh, you know, Washington, DC. So we have Duke in DC, but we also have like kind of the native universities. We have Howard, and Howard is not the same as Georgetown, mm -hmm. and Georgetown is not the same as UGC, right? Context matters. Mm -hmm. The needs of the people, uh, the collective matter with respect to both that environment that they're in that's both physical and digital, so, yeah. Mark. Yeah, I'm, I think the, <clears throat> some of the work we've done on, on, on data trust is a good microcosm for this in the sense that um, my friend uh, Neil Lawrence, who um, teaches machine learning at, at Cambridge, used to be at, at Amazon actually, um, wrote an article a few years ago in The Guardian about, about data trusts and about uh, the need for an ecosystem of trust to, to reflect the variegated interests and, and realities of, of different groups. Uh, how that will work in practice, to, to your point, this is part of the stuff that we're working on through this, this, uh, this new network of universities that are going to do more, more research and we're very excited about. Um, so there's a lot to, to figure out still, but the mm -hmm. point of it was that you need to account for the fact that there's going to be variegated interests. At the same time, though, I think that a structure like the human rights framework points to there are still a certain, despite this, these variegations, there are still essentialist points where there is a baseline, right, of, of individual rights and of, of collective rights that, that, that need to be respected despite the fact that we need to account for, for these variances in approaches. So same goes with, um, with uh, legislation and, and to your earlier point that you were making about mm. jurisdiction chopping and, mm. and varying, uh, varying points. It's like that in corporate law in Canada, at least as well. I mean, you can certainly have a company that's set up in the, in the Cayman Islands, but pass a th certain threshold of what Canadian corporate law will agree to. They'll pe pierce the corporate veil and they'll go across it and, and still hold the, the domestic director uh, liable for the acts of that corporation because they've decided that there's a line at which you've crossed that we, we, we can't accept. And I think that in the world of of data, I think the human rights framework can be a, a good analytical tool to, to find what that line is and to define it based on groundings that are a thousand years old, uh, while still allowing us to have uh, variegated approaches to how we manage our data. Mary. Um, so I think that one of the elements that is at play when Jasmine's talking about context is basically like we all care about vulnerable communities and we know that. Um, when we're talking about uh, traditional uses of power, those have not been well enough taken into account and that plays out in data uh, uses as it does in other contexts. Your insecurities in the offline world, being a woman walking through a neighborhood are played out as, an insecure, as the lack of security in the online world, being a woman walking through the internet. I mean, like there was kind of this initial glow, I think, with the internet that it was going to be a great equalizer. Um, you read articles from the 90s about how like online no one would know you're a woman and it will be just a marketplace of ideas. Um, I'm serious. Uh, and now, of course, we know the Hobbesian way it has played out. Um, and so I think that obviously it's really important to think about how as we develop technology, we should always be thinking about how this will impact the most vulnerable communities and what kinds of protections we have in place or how we could architect them differently to better apprise folks of their rights, et cetera. Um, but I also see like we could flip this in a lot of dimensions to be thinking about how technology will enable us. So, you know, Chris talks a little bit about kind of ephemeral companies and the fact that we could just do um, companies as code. Like, yeah, that counts. <laughs> To me, that sounds pretty awesome. So there are elements of automating things that I think we should be embracing. No one wants to sit across from a lawyer. And by the way, guess who has access to lawyers? Rich people. Like, guess who has traditionally been stock traders in this analog version? Rich people. So there's elements here that we should be thinking about that are not like, um, that were never good in the good old boys days anyway, and that might look different now that we're talking about access and we're talking about um, communities. And I think we could be thinking about how we reconstruct these technologies 
We definitely need to be thinking about diverse development teams so that people can take into account the kinds of unintended consequences or, um, I mean, we just build better technologies when we have more of the stuff that life is made of in the room. Um, but part of this, I think, is not just trying to put up guardrails against the technologies, but thinking how do we integrate them and how do we do it with better awareness. But not just um, diverse uh, technologists, diverse from you know not just technologists, other people as well, surely, because one of the one of the challenges is is that um, is that uh, you know is this you know you've got a hammer, you see things as a hammer, you you you're you're, you're, you're going to be trained as a technologist, you, diverse ones absolutely, but you're going to be trained to be thinking of solving problems in a certain way, and I think and I think one of the challenges is is that you know I mean this you talk about the 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 um, uh, you know, the, the technologies potentially being, um, you know, uh, allowing access, improving, improving some of these power imbalances. But actually what we've seen is, is, is actually the opposite. We've seen winner-takes-all eco you know, economics. Uh, we've seen the biggest concentrations of power we've ever seen. When we, something like Uber, I mean, nobody thinks that taxi companies were, were benign, wonderful things. They're often connected with organized crime, but replacing those what, you know, lots of bad small companies with, with one global company is, is definitely not, not progress, I wouldn't say, particularly one that doesn't have any, any real, real governance. Maybe, but it also means that people who miss the bus can get to their wage hour shift on time and can do it, you know, from a smartphone that costs 50 bucks or less. Um, you know, like there are ways in which we take for granted, like a lot of the... Um, exchanges that we have made the transactions in your terms, which I think is a fair word. Um, I think we give too little credit to people for having made these conscious transactions. Things are more convenient. Things are more accessible. Um, there's tons of reasons that we should embrace technologies and be also thinking about the concerning ways in which you know, large aggregations uh, are not necessarily good for us. But I don't see them as universally bad, and I certainly think that it's happening. So we might as well get on board and kind of figure out how to um, charter these in a you know responsible way. So is that uh, is that the um, is that our, our, our choice? You know, missing the missing the bus or having global overlords essentially. <laughs> That's what I, I think. <laughs> I, I mean, are... these days, like, you look at the realities, though, and, like, plenty of folks are using rideshare where public transportation has failed them, including in my neighborhood in Trinidad. Uh, so I don't think that it is such a simple story that, you know, Uber becomes your overlord. We all accept a lot of personalization in exchange for a use case. Um, and while I can see that there are elements of how Uber kind of sets the defaults, to be exploitative, there's also elements that we opt into because we choose to. And I think that we it's kind of silly to um, remove all agency from folks just because they are participating in a system that does give some benefits, even if it also has some detractions. Mark, are you going to say something? Yeah, I just take issue with the concept that there's necessarily full agency and these are conscious <laughs> transactions. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just, like ultimately these are, you know, adhesion contracts if, if you've ever seen one in the sense that they're terms and conditions. If you read the terms and conditions of Uber and you disagree with section 27C, what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna call the global legal council of Uber and renegotiate your own terms and conditions for section, that's what you're, yeah, you, <laughs> you know, you don't really have a choice. And in circumstances where, to your point, if you don't have proper bus services and you get to use Uber, I think it's, you know, it's, it's good that you have, in a sense, a choice, but, but it's not a real choice. Again, you're choosing within terms and conditions that have been privatized and to which you have no say uh, or impact. That's part of the reasons why we were talking about data trust is as a collective action mechanism to be able to get a whole lot more people so that you can potentially have a chance of, sec of changing section 27C. And if you get to a point where something is so ubiqui ubiquitous and such a public service, even though it's privatized, then maybe it should be a public good in any case. Yeah, well, we see people like recreating the public bus as Lyft ride chairs all the time. I think that that's totally fair, but the reality is the private sector owns and operates the infrastructure of the internet. Private sector owns and operates the uh, uh, majority of your physical infrastructure, like water and dams. So 
if that's a reality we don't like, then we need to be thinking about how to restructure things. But there's also elements that are just at play here where I think it is problematic that we are expecting companies to jump in and play a um, social good role when they don't, <laughs> they have an obligation to their bottom line. But I think that's a broader conversation. Jasmine, yeah. go. Right. I, you know, th and this is where the personhood of a corporation butts up against them not being human. Um, <laughs> like, because so, uh, and, and the humanity space is lost, right? So for example, there have been ride shares in communities for a long time, but they didn't collect data. I mean, the data they collected was maybe your name, but the address, whether where you wanted to get picked up and dropped off, and like whether or not you paid. But the, the, the issue with the corporate large ride sharing organization is that there is a whole lot extracted from you and a whole lot expected from you to continue to use that service. Um, and the problem is, you're right, we are using a privatized issue. I think along with the contracts mm -hmm. you were talking about, we forget also like the idea of social contracts, mm -hmm. right? Like what is the responsibility of us to larger society? We can say we have none or whatever, but we kind of do. But also what is the responsibility of organizations and corporations included to the society that they are functioning in, right? So if you, Uber, use the roads, presumably the public pays taxes and you're using a good that is a public good um, for free, right? Or based on what other people have put into it. So the question is like, can we use kind of a social contract kind of expectation for Uber, for the hospitals, for the governments to function as we think it should function based on the idea that they're persons mm -hmm. functioning within this society where we have these ideas or ideas. Obviously that's not happening, but perhaps that's, that expectation should then move from expectation to the more regulatory governance part of the program. Okay, I'm going to open up to the floor now. Um, uh, yep. So, so, do we have a microphone? I think I do. So, one of the things that's interesting about the last couple of comments are that. You know, when did we get to the point where the where you have to click uh, terms of service okay before you can access what is a service. So um, is, that, is that because of the litigious society? Is that because there is value in the data that you can capture at that point? I mean, where, where did, how did we get to that point? How did we get to the point where to access Duke's um, guest, um, guest um, network, you have to agree to their terms of service? It's everywhere. So, Maybe that's a place where we really need to consider divorcing service and service provision and service providers from that secondary um, commitment that someone, uh, the agency versus the pseudo versus the adhesion contract, um, maybe that's a place where there's some room to look where the norm actually is. I mean, does Uber, what is, why does Uber lift? Lyft need all that data because they don't really need that data to provide the service. They want that data in order to be able to get you as a repeat customer or to sell that data to someone else or 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 whatever they're whatever they're doing with it. But it doesn't need to be there in order to provide the service. And I, I think that's a I think that that's a place where we have become complacent about just clicking through and just signing the um, I agree because it's the way to get where you want to go at that particular instant um, and without really having any, having any alternative but to do that. I'm going to take a couple more questions if that's okay and then we'll, we'll get um, so okay. Go for it. So um, I, I wanted to come back to this I keep coming back to these themes that I, I hear on this panel, which are shared identity. Like we're, we're talking a little bit about identity and people affected. And I, I think back to a congressional invest, like the, the questions that were asked um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I forget which congresswoman it was, but she said the people are, the power needs to be closest to the people with pain. 
And so I, I want to go back to, yeah, consent, as you say, is broken, and, and we agree. Um, and so this question of like governing our digital selves, how might we think about the people affected as the, the ones leading the way? How might we think about representation of these identities across technologies when, as you say, as a, a, a hammer or a scalpel could be any, <coughs> any technology, and knowing how that identity is affected has to come from representation from those people. Do you, do you think that's possible at this point? Can we do that? Okay, one more. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, I'm Laura Walker McDonald, um, and I I want, wanted to pick up on your point actually, which was about um, having different people in the room who are not technologists. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, the organisation I work for, Digital Impact Alliance, did some research on the international development, digital development space, a couple of years ago, and the people who were calling for um, for a change were. I mean, lots of different things, but the technologists were actually pleading to have more of these conversations with other people. Because I think a couple things are playing out. One is that there's quite poor awareness of the nuances of these discussions, the, the way that the engineering and the law and the societal issues mix in the general population, but also in leadership and in decision makers, policy makers, leaders of businesses, leaders of countries who have to make decisions. And the second thing is that tech is really cool. And so you get knee-jerk reactions and knee-jerk decisions being made based on assumptions about what's going to happen. Or, for example, um, another piece of research we did was, um, in, a, in a previous role, said that um, people were investing in blockchain because they needed to have some answer to how they were going to meet an impossible humanitarian caseload because they knew they couldn't do it through conventional means, so they were trying to describe a moonshot, even though they didn't have the tools to know whether it was going to work. So I think we do need more people in the conversation, but we need to demystify what's actually happening, have a real conversation about with, uh, how, to, how do we make this simple enough that people who are making decisions can really engage, and that has to include uh, communities, absolutely. It must include the most vulnerable. I think that's a real challenge for us as this gets more and more complicated. Cool. Who wants to respond to those points first? So I think, um, I guess, kind of a reflection of all those that we can't ignore that communities, because they've lost trust in government, in other organizations, in corporate organizations, they are, many communities are doing this <coughs> collectiveness, this gathering for themselves because of a lot of reasons, right? But they are doing this. They are working with various technologies. They are teaching each other, teaching themselves, teaching each other. Uh, safety and security. They are teaching each other and themselves about different technologies, whether it's blockchain and cryptocurrency or Tor browsing or uh, the latest apps or surveillance or other civic-based um, technologies that are deployed in their communities and safety and those kinds of things. So they are teaching each other. They are advocating for themselves and the other peoples in their communities. The question is, though, is who is willing to listen um, and who thinks that they're, what they have to say is expert enough to merit attention? Mm. So if I don't have a degree in computer science or engineering or you know, various technology-related degrees, am I worthy of listening to? If I don't have a degree at all, Am I worthy of listening to? If I just got released from prison, if I just, you know, opened a, you know, email account in 2019, am I worthy of being listened to? Like, are my reasons, is my rationale, is that elite enough to be considered something worthy of attention or worthy of listening to? Are my experiences enough? So we can get like all of each other in a room with like at least most people I'm assuming have at least like BAs or working towards them. We have some JDs or LLBs, depending on what country and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We have some PhDs, but what if you don't have that? And we could talk about like technologists need to talk to uh, social scientists and lawyers. That's a very elite group. 
And with, even within the United States, that's only a very small portion of the population. But that other portion of the population are people affected by the decisions that that group makes. So who's the expert? Who gets to call, be called an expert? The encouraging thing I said, like I said, is that communities see this and they're like, we're going to do it for ourselves, <coughs> or at least attempt to do it. All right, did you want to come in? Uh, no, I didn't really hear a question <laughs> in what was said, so okay. I'll wait for her okay. wait for uh, a question. Well, there, well, there's two kind of types of questions to, to answer for me. So on the adhesion contract front, you know, the, how did we get here, et cetera. I mean, adhesion contracts exist because uh, they're useful. You know, they make transactions happen much faster. Every time you get a receipt when you buy a coffee, in, this, in essence, that's an adhesion contract, you know, because if every single time you have to have a meeting of the minds as to how you would agree with the liability over the coffee, if it's too hot, et cetera, it just, it wouldn't work, right? So there's, there's a social reason why we have uh, such a thing as, as adhesion contracts or contracts as things. But uh, what we built as a society is a bunch of tools to mitigate the worst of the power imbalances uh, normally in those types of adhesion contracts. So in Canada and Quebec, you have a Consumer Protection Act, so that if you go and you buy a fridge and it says at Best Buy and it says final sale and you buy the fridge, you bring it home and you plug it in and it doesn't work, the fact that the contract would have, that the receipt said final sale doesn't matter. The Consumer Protection Act protects you and guarantees that you're supposed to expect normal behavior on the part of the thing that you have purchased, that you have the right to return any product within 30 days, that if there is a different price offered in two different stores, that you can get the lowest of the two prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is the Consumer Protection Act doesn't apply if you get a service for free. Mm -hmm. Hence, doesn't apply if you're in, you know, using Google, if you're using Facebook, if you're in, in any type of, of circumstance like that. So there's a lot of circumstances where it may make sense to have adhesion contracts, but in data-based kind of transactions, et cetera, there tends to be no layer of, of protection. Uh, and so we need to ensure that, that we, we have those if you continue to maintain something like, like adhesion contracts as the basis of these transactions. I don't necessarily think you need to maintain these adhesion contracts. The other thing about the ridiculousness of it is, even with the layer of, of data collection that we have right now that's going to expand tremendously, if you tried to read all the terms and conditions of all the websites and applications you use in a given year, they estimate it would take you 12 weeks of full-time work. So who has the time to go and, and, and do that and to really inform themselves? Part of what we were looking at with regards to data trust, and that's the question of, of communities and different types of representations, is could you get to a, a degree of volume of people who are in a given trust to reflect a certain set of interests to be able to, to do that negotiation on your behalf uh, so that you have you know, different uh, settings uh, with regards to your, the use of your, of your personal information. The problem is it can't become as complicated uh, as you know, the or the volume that you have of terms and conditions to click through to, to manage that. So if you're going to build something like data trust, you also need technological tools and approaches that are going to allow that to actually function and to and to be as useful in a marketplace as as adhesion contracts. And so that's some of the work that that we're trying to trying to work on. Um, so just, just a quick interjection. Actually, this kind of reminds me. I would encourage you to also think in terms of the ways that. Um, in addition to governance or privacy constructions that just physical security um, revolves around this white shoe commoditization. Um, so for example, your iPhone, um, how many folks in the room have an iPhone or a Droid that came out within the last year? So you're inheriting the cybersecurity best practices <coughs> and the supply chain and the proprietariness of you know, a white shoe commodity company. Um, if you're looking at someone who's got a Cricut wireless pay-as-you-go plan, they inherit all the insecurities of all the vendors that they do business with down the chain. And so you can look at this from any aspect of your life, from your Amex card to your doorman building, um, you know, the physical and the um, non-physical world uh, interact with each other in this sense. And so you get, because your security profile as an individual is the um, amalgamation of all of those interactions, and because it is impossible now to track down every vendor down the supply chain, who you are doing business with um, by nature of walking around in the world, those of us uh, who have an Amex and an iPhone or a, you know, a sophisticated uh, risk posture in the world are walking around with security as a white shoe commodity. And I'm not sure we've had a conversation as a country that we are willing to accept that. Do I have time for any more questions, Sean?
Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, Ken, if you want a quick one. How do we equip uh, these communities to keep up and educate them and equip them so that they can keep up and, and hold their own? Okay. And then in the, in the green behind. Uh, Stephanie Dock, I'm with the District of Columbia's Department of Transportation, and I'm dealing a lot with um, TNC and other types of data that are coming in that we are regulatorily requiring. And this whole conversation about what these companies are collecting on us and the part, I think the example of Jitneys versus um, TNC, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, which we call transportation network companies, that um, they are collecting that data. We are now also requiring them to collect that data. When you ride a scooter on the street, we require that. And I'm double checking, but I don't think when we put the public comment out about our terms and conditions for our next round of the permits that anybody except the company said anything about the data requirements. Even though those companies were like, whoa, that's a lot, we're not sure. But what is the government's role then in also reinforcing and potentially creating these data regimes that are driving this? And uh, Sean, did you have someone there? Hi, um, I'm Peter Colohan. Um, I work at Duke. I manage uh, the Internet of Water project. Uh, and so we're concerned with managing water resource data. Uh, and the question I wanted to, or thread that I heard all of you saying that I would like to pull on or ask you to pull on, is this, this question of humanity versus data. So in the Internet of Water project, we talk about um, something in, in how we represent the water resources of, of, of the nation and the world. And if you're thinking about, for example, a lake, how, that does, how does that appear on the internet? And there's a term I'll just share to kind of highlight what I'm saying. It's a non-information resource, a thing in the real world we want to reference. So the point is data is representational. It's not the real world. It's not the real world. That we are using data as a medium for representing the real world. And what we've talked, what you guys are I think starting to hit on is the human rights construct, the real communities, the real humans. How do we reinforce that humanity and sort of help people gain control over their data by and reestablish uh, our kind of sense of identity with respect to our communities and the real world and recognizing that the phone and the instrument and the data set we're working with is not the real world, it's a representation. And that, that let that be a vehicle for increasing our, essentially our control over this data universe. And the natural resource in our case, the water resource, which is so critical that we share as a human right. So. Uh, was that one more um, over there? Thank you. Who wants to start? I'm getting stared at here. <laughs> uh, I'll give it a stab, sure. Um, I'm trying to remember all of the questions, though. There was a lot of different ones. I mean, to your point, I'm not going to offer a very substantive answer to this, so I'm sorry. But, uh, but one thing that it brought up is, is this concept of data deserts. So there was a, a push in Canada to um, bring about uh, basically like drone coverage over uh, national parks to make uh, to, to both collect information but at the same time to, to, to connect you should you need it etc and there was a, a lot of public pushback because the point of going to Banff National Park is to just get out right and to be away from this entire uh, 
this ecosystem of, of, of data collection and, and, and so on. So, um, so that really took Parks Canada um, by surprise, the, the extent to which like, people were pushing for it. So I think there's a, there's a greater kind of broad understanding that, that it shouldn't all be about data commodification. So that's the only point I'll make about that. Uh, as to what it'll take to try to uh, get some change on uh, data governance, well, as a lobbyist, uh, more Cambridge Analytica stuff will probably help uh, in the sense that, you know, the more, the more they're faced with immediate pressure, uh, the more they will, you know, need to come up with uh, responses to the public. You've seen just in, and we did a little bit of polling in Canada in public trust in the GAFAs, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Um, and in the last, like, two and a half years, it's a precipitous collapse. And that correlation really helps politically when you're mm. trying to pitch something that doesn't necessarily align with the interests uh, of the big companies. So that's one thing that'll help. And then the other thing you need are concrete solutions and, and, and tools. Hence the, the point of why we're talking about data trust and the human rights framework and so on. Uh, to my earlier point about just how, how busy and how many different sectors uh, a ministry or a department tends to cover. It's incumbent upon all of us to actually come up with with tools and, and recommendations. So something like modifying the Consumer Protection Act uh, so that it covers uh, your transactions online as well would be one concrete uh, hmm. solution. So I think to connect a couple of points to to help communities, there are folks that are attempting to help communities as well. What they need is like funding <laughs> and and consistent funding. So I'm thinking like the National Digital Inclusion Alliance in the United States, thinking of various programs. Uh, uh, libraries need funding like forever. Um, so because they're very important and they actually do this literacy, digital literacy, large scale work all the time, but they just get ignored. So I think there are agencies, there's organizations doing this work, they just need funding and support. But one thing I want to um, connect a couple of uh, questions is that for me, language matters. So how we talk about <coughs> it, we continue to talk about data, but we, we talk about it in, in the terms of property and that's, I think, a huge part of the problem mm. because it separates, it abstracts mm. data from the person. Mm. Um, I mean, when we're talking about individual data, not necessarily water data, but which does have implications for the people as well, right? When we continue to talk about it as property, then that leads us to think about it as a separate thing from the human, from the community, from the collective. And I think that imaginary perpetuates why we have such a problem with um, doing better with respect to governance and regulatory schemes. So how do we like operationalize that? So when we talk about data, we talk about data, but we try to steer away from ownership language, property language, um, and then talk about it as either observations, representations, or just like the person, quite frankly, which makes it more salient to, I think, people. So instead of, um, you know, your data, it's, well, Uber understands you. Mm -hmm. Amazon understands you. Uh, the city government understands you to a certain extent. So I think that kind of change is going to be really important um, when we, like, fr how we frame uh, is important. So, yeah. Yeah, I heard some echoes in here of, like, especially um, from the city government perspective, like, you know, this is not just a generic political view, like the far left and far right meet on a lot of these issues. So something to think about, just like what will the real world repercussions be? And, you know, in terms of animating uh, or reanimating from these like concepts or data or whatever constructions, um, you know, again, conscripting like the, the notion that engineers write algorithms, that AI is not a thing, like it is, the outcome of human inputs. We still are the ones in charge here. Um, we need to maybe have better conversations about what the outcomes we want are and how to avoid uh, biases and bad outcomes, which we know to be a trap here um, or a reality. Um, so I mean, I think that part of this is that coming back to like the idea that there is a huge human element here. Um, some 
things are, are more suitable to having computers do than other things. So having real conversations about what data would be useful to have versus what is just distracting or not helpful or dangerous for entities to continue to or start to require to um, maintain. Um, and, and by the same you know, thought, like what can we be, how can we be use, putting data to work better or how can we be constructing better uh, versions of the kinds of tasks that we think computers are better at? Um, you know, these are, there are a lot of times we could be thinking about just like constrained outcomes that are easier for a computer to do than a human. I don't think we should be supplanting our values decisions with computers. We've got time for a quick question from Lucy. Lucy. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. Lucy Bernholtz from uh, the Digital Civil Society Lab. First Nations in Canada and Aboriginal communities in Australia and to a lesser degree Native Americans in this country have developed data sovereignty relationships for decades. They've been in place for decades and they interact with their overarching national governments in certain ways. And I'm wondering uh, if there is are lessons to be learned for the companies and other governments about what their rules and responsibilities need to be to uh, respect, if, if they can respect, which I don't know that they do, the data sovereignty of those communities, A, in digital spaces at all, I don't know if that's actually happening, um, and B, uh, to Jasmine's um, uh, ideas about diverse community representations, if there's something in the interstitial layer between those communities that have established those data sovereignty um, rules and the majority governments, what's in that layer that we might be able to learn from, if anything? Are we done? Yeah, Go for it. Okay. So, I would just say that, yeah, I mean, they are, I, I think uh, tribal law in the US and elsewhere is a really interesting model to look at as a foil um, and as itself, because it's not just data sovereignty, it's tribal sovereignty in all dimensions, right, if we were actually respecting treaty law. Um, so I see some parallels with military community, for example, who are bound by a different set of legal expectations. Um, and we see their uh, data expectations and their privacy expectations look different. I think we should be taking um, both international and national versions of legal regimes that look different and drawing from them lessons. I don't, uh, I don't know that there is a neat packaged way that we can activate that, but I definitely, I've written some about, you know, like for example, um, the uh, ar around who's the witness to your internet crime. So in the military, if you have a um, drug test or a rape kit or a child pornography crime um, where you're talking about a machine layer uh, and you need a, um, a witness in court under the Sixth Amendment, they just call up some guy who testifies to the data retention policies of the company. Um, should we even have that layer of court inquiry or is it just like a rodeo? Um, it are some of these questions that military has answered differently than civilian courts. So I think there's definitely uh, interesting elements of you know, tribal law being an outlier in the sense that there is sovereignty within the, the country and then looking at other international regimes. I definitely think it's a good um, jumping off point to examine what works and what doesn't. I'm not convinced that in, you know, international companies uh, are always uh, necessarily all that influenced by those kinds of governmental constructions. So I think it can be a, a, a good um, entry. At the same time, when we think of uh, treaties and we think of recognition of various Aboriginal groups or First Nations groups, the, whether or not they're recognized is the huge first layer of the problem, right? So can, are you an actual tribe in the United States, like the government decides who gets to be a tribe or not, right? And so that right there is problematic because then you cannot be a sovereign if you're not recognized as a collective, as a human group or community worthy of, of, of recognition. But I think the lessons from that is that groups of individuals can come together and make decisions about 
um, their collective goals, what's, co what's collectively good for that group, and then attempt to implement some kinds of structures, um, um, systems to, that reflects those, but also assists in moving forward. Um, I, I, we've got uh, about uh, seven minutes left, um, and I just wondered uh, if there are any burning questions. Otherwise, I'm going to ask the, the panel to wrap up with some, some closing thoughts. Okay, so maybe um, a, a couple of, oh sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm so sorry. Thank you all very much, this is really inspiring. Thank you, oh wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the sales pitch that you gave to, was it to like municipal governments and large customers, it was like, I'm gonna butcher it, but it was something like, if you had all the data you wanted and could run unlimited analytics on it, I feel like, was that something close? Yeah. It feels like, that cuts to the like the core of this convening in the sense that like should that be a sales pitch that should be allowed to be made like I'm like with due respect I'm like a little bit frightened by the idea of like a police department having unlimited data and ability to run unlimited analytics provided to them by a corporation that has the capacity to do so you know without some level of governance or some level of decision making by the public or the people who will be whose data is involved, like whether it's from Ring or from Alexa or from whatever, like it seems like those are, yeah, I'm, I guess that's my, I don't have an answer, but I'm just <laughs> wondering like, how do you like think about the govern, governing constraints for you and you, you go out, you know, to make that pitch on a regular basis, like how do you, you know, think about who should be governing you, um, whether or not you as an, you know, as the representative of a company should be allowed to be able to do that um, because nobody has explicitly stopped you from doing it. Um, what are the kind of considerations that go into making an ask like that or an offer like that? Uh, yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, totally fair. I, it is not my job to decide whether Amazon should be allowed to take certain types of data or not within, and frankly, as a cloud provider, we don't know the types of data that folks are choosing to house within our um, you know, physical systems. Only folks who are seeing the content layer would know what that is. Um, but in your example, for example, I mean, Police departments are constrained by rules and laws just like everyone else. So if you have issues with those, that seems like something that you should write to your Congress people about. Um, this is not something, I mean, I, I'm not saying that Amazon doesn't have a role in having conversations about data governance, but when I'm talking to customers, what I'm trying to signal to them is that the functional uh, limits have been unleashed, right? So I think that primes for, that's why I told that anecdote, that primes for the conversation about what kinds of data we should be interacting with and how and what that looks like now. Um, it doesn't answer those questions. What it does is set up that there are there is so much data that frankly, even like transparency, it's not necessarily a good in itself because we're always gonna see enfranchised entities have better access and better tools to do something with that data than less enfranchised folks, right? So at some level, what we're really talking about is in this new reality where there is so much data how do we decide what we think good uses of data are? How do we decide and implement ways to um, allow for folks to be using data in new ways, but ways that continue to align with our values broadly? Okay. Um, so maybe if you could, uh, uh, guys could uh, give us some closing thoughts. Um, I've got one maybe just to, to uh, uh, which you can respond to or come up with some, something different, which is actually about the nature of the corporation. Um, Merit, you talked about, you know, that this is people in the end. And actually, I think there's resonances here with the 20s and the 30s and so on, and Steinbeck. I mean, Steinbeck was, you know, in Great Sort of Rust was talking about, you know, the faceless corporation and about the, it's the bank, and I just work for the bank, and every, every layer up there doesn't, doesn't actually feel that they have control. It's a more of a systemic issue. And it's the incentives within the system, and it's the the way way it works. And, um, and we're building systems here which are immensely complex. And so, uh, and in a sense, the article about fireflies and algorithms was saying that this complexity is going to be increasing, and the the um, the uh, speed of change and the speed of complexity is going to be increasing too. 
what does what does good look like? What does good governance look like? A little bit um, in in ones where actually the ability for and, and this comes down to the AI issue as well. The ability for anybody to really understand the system still less influence it. Or you can come up with your own closing thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if this is just a, a short wrap up, I'd say you know reasserting or 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 democratic control and the, and the fact that, that we are human beings who are affected by these decisions, who have a, a right and a say in, uh, in, in how, that, uh, how that data is being collected in the first place, how it is being used, areas where it should be used, that this is fundamentally within our control. And to, to Jasmine's earlier point, which, which I love, made me think of uh, George Orwell's The Politics of, of the English Language, like words matter, think of the words that, that you use when I go and pitch in front of politicians to your uh, Grapes of Wrath point, I'll tell the story of a Tom Joad mm. and a real person as opposed to talking about you know, data collection and this data subject and this person. Talking about how data is being collected by Uber about you being resold in this situation, uh, etc. So, so I think it's important that, that we think of that and when we don't bring it back to, 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 to that reality or to your point about data being a representation, then you get bad policy suggestions like the idea that you know, AIs should be their own legal persons and we should you know, hold AIs as legally accountable as opposed to the human engineers that, that built it or the, or the people that are, that are deploying it. Um, so, so that's what I think I would, I would close on and I'll make one semi-controversial point to end with regards to you know, representation of groups and, and, and so on. I often cringe when, when we're talking about representation in, in building out AIs because it's often discussed in an instrumental way, that like you want it so that you get better product output. And I think that's a valuable thing, but you also just want representation for its own sake because it's a good in and of itself. Um, and I think that speaks to kind of the, the the assertion of, of democratic control and democratic representation. And it's not to say that I don't want representation when we're building out AI products, but that if we came out with uh, a technical or engineering method by which you were capable of detecting bias in data sets, by that factor, would that mean that you don't need representation anymore in the fact that you are building out, uh, building out solutions? No, it's because it's a, it's a good in and of itself. Jasmine? So I think data governance must be participatory to be any way approaching good and successful and that participatory I mean uh, including um, vulnerable traditionally marginalized but also um, different kinds of groups government corporate uh, non-government or civil society organizations and a cut across a wide swath of different kinds of individuals and needs but also recognizing that context is going to matter, um, and kind and category are going to matter. Um, so I, I think that, you know, whenever we're saying words matter, we should also be thinking code matters um, on the same bent. And unfortunately, there's no such thing as like tech without biases. Like there's no such thing as humans without biases. Um, you know, Dan Kahneman wrote books about it and got a Nobel Prize. But basically, um, you know, another word for that is shortcuts or um, just the way that you problem solve, right? So the uncomfortable reality here, I think, is that it's a process. Um, and as a security person, I kind of live in this reality all the time that the idea of security feels like a concrete end state, but the reality is it is just a set of processes and there are better and worse outcomes, but there is never kind of an end point. Um, and so I think what we're really trying to drive at here is better delineating the processes to articulate, um, you know, lining up more of how we get processes that lead us to better outcomes. Okay, thanks very much everyone. And uh, it's closing thought, wouldn't it be really cool I could say this in front of a bunch of lawyers and, and, uh, and geeks and so on, but it wouldn't be really cool if the year, word of the year for 2020 was adhesion. <laughs> um, but anyhow, thanks very much for everyone. It would be, it's been uh, really fascinating and, and uh, thanks for your time.